Well, good morning, class. Welcome to week number 13 here in oceanography. A couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, the first announcement is this Wednesday, the 10th, you have discussion number five and the field guide due. So this Wednesday, the 10th, you have discussion number five and the field guide do. This week, we will be doing a two-part lecture. Today, uh, we will be looking at the first half of our program, uh, Selected Ecosystems from Around the World. We'll be looking at what a living fossil is. We'll be looking at what introduced species are. Those uh, dovetail from the marine ecology class we had last. Then we'll be moving into the intertidal zone. On Wednesday, we'll cover subtidal habitats. So today we'll wrap up ecology with living fossils and introduce species. The intertidal zone. And then Wednesday we'll study subtidal communities. Just a review, when we're looking at communities, you're looking at all of the different populations that live in a particular habitat and how they uh, interact with each other. When you're looking at ecosystems, you also include the non-living factors, which are called abiotic. Now, living fossils are organisms that have been around for a very long time without much change. So uh, many times they're an evolutionary dead end. This image here is of a coelacanth. Coelacanth are interesting fish. They belong to a group of fish called the lobed fin fish. Uh, so in, if you look at a coelacanth, these fins, they have fleshy lobes where the scales come off of. In those fleshy lobes, they actually have... They actually have the humerus, radius, ulna, and phalanges all uh, in the um, in their uh, limbs. You have the uh, pectoral girdle, which are your arms and hands. Your pelvic girdle, which are the legs. That's what us uh, quadrupeds have. Here you have the fleshy lobe. So um, they actually also have gas bladders that have been adapted to uh, lungs. So uh, these are uh, direct relatives of the cross opterygii, which uh, gave rise to the amphibians. This is a ginkgo, which is a land living fossil, but living fossils uh, are any species that have been unchanged in the fossil records and have no living uh, relatives. Charles Darwin coined the phrase living fossil to describe this ginkgo, which we actually utilize for memory as a supplement, but this has been around for 240 million years, shows no evolution, and has no other relatives. So a living fossil has been around for a very long time, hasn't changed, doesn't have living relatives. The living relatives are in the fossil record, but they're, um, they're not living if they're in the fossil record. Uh, so brachiopods are the oldest marine living fossil. 
Uh, here's brachiopods. In the fossil records, their little shell here is preserved. Uh, they're easily mistaken for clams and other mollusks, which are the dominant intertidal species today, as far as the shelled species. But um, you can see they're not clams. They have this stalk. They have an opening in their uh, bivalve. And they have this ciliated tongue called a lothophore, which is a uh, special feeding structure that is used to strain the water for microorganisms and plankton. They were once dominant, and most shell fossils that we find uh, are actually brachiopods and not um, mollusks, as far as the bivalve looking ones. These, this lingula, is the oldest known evolutionary unchanged animal that is still alive today. So it's an evolutionary dead end. They have a lothophore and they resemble clams, but they're totally different lineage of animal. The Nautilus is the only living cephalopod that has an external shell. So cephalopod are the most advanced invertebrates. They belong to phylum mollusca. Cephalopod translates to head foot. So they have these tentacles on their head. They have complex eyes. They move with a siphuncal, which uh, is uh, a tube that uses jets of water to scoot around. So they do belong to the nectin. Uh, the nautiluses and their kin uh, have millions, uh, hundreds of millions of year old fossils, 200 million year old fossils. Uh, the only living one today is the chambered nautilus. The horseshoe crab is one that we're all familiar with. They are very common in the Gulf, North Atlantic, off the coast of uh, North America. And they belong to an ancient lineage that included the trilobites. They have blue blood. Ours is iron-based, turns red when oxygenated. Theirs is copper-based, turns blue when oxygenated. This blue blood is actually used by the medical industry to detect infection and impurities. So these guys are milked. It's not really milk. They call it milking for some weird reason. They're bled, and their blood is collected, and it's used uh, uh, in medical analysis. So they're, they're very interesting creatures. They do not belong to the order Crustacea, which is uh, all the other uh, aquatic arthropods, with the exception of the sea spider and the horseshoe crab, belong to Crustacea. So these guys are really unique. They're common, and they date back to the uh, trilobites, which used to dominate the ocean. This oddball right here, this oddball, is considered uh, by many as the most disgusting creature on the planet. That is the hagfish. It is a jawless invertebrate fish, the only invertebrate fish there is. It belongs to its own group called craniata because it does have a skull, a cranium, and then it has cartilage, not bone, uh, support a cartilage rod supporting it, so it doesn't have full vertebrae. So this hagfish is grouped with the jawless fish. Uh, it's also nicknamed is the slime eel. Uh, why the slime eel? Uh, well, it what, what, how it makes a living is it crawls into an opening of a dying organism, either the anus or the uh, mouth. Uh, as the organism is dying, uh, it secretes very caustic fluid that starts to dissolve the flesh and then it and liquefy the flesh. And it basically drinks the liquefied flesh uh, of the dead or dying organism. So they are. Uh, scavengers, uh, they are decomposers, uh, they kind of crawl in the dying or 
already dead larger organism and uh, digest it from the inside out. Uh, so they make a lot of slime. Uh, and they, they're very good contortionists because they can wiggle around the body tubes and things like that. Another jawless fish, but this one does have vertebrae, is the lamprey. This is the mouth of the lamprey, no lower jaw. It has horn teeth, which basically stick on the side of its quarry, and then they drain it of body fluids. So they're large ectoparasites, ecto meaning outside. We already saw the coelacanth. The coelacanth was thought to have been extinct when the dinosaurs perished, but uh, one was caught in 1938, and then there's been a few others caught since. And they belong to the group of Sarcopterygii, as it's called, uh, the lobed fin fish. The lungfish belong to this exact group as well. And it's believed that these are linked to vertebrates, uh, land vertebrates. Uh, in the Devonian, Devonian, uh, about 450 million years ago, the first lungfish fossils are found. They have tooth enamel, an arrangement of skull bones that are similar to the amphibians. They show separation of pulmonary and systemic blood flow. They have legs, position and structure, and lungs. All right, let me explain each one of these. The tooth enamel, uh, teeth are derivatives of scales, uh, evolutionarily speaking, comes from that, uh, from scales. So the enamel, the hard bone part of our teeth, which are not from scales, you know, I mean, it's, it's um, an aggregate around it, uh, first show up in the lungfish, showing a link to higher vertebrates, if you will. The arrangement of skull bones also are uh, diverge from the fish and uh, take on the shape of amphibians, the first land vertebrate or higher vertebrate. Pulmonary is lung, systemic is body. And you well know that we have a pulmonary circulatory system pumps to the lungs, back to the heart. We have a systemic circulatory system, pumps to the body, back to the heart. And that's what higher vertebrates tend to have. They have separate systemic and pulmonary systems. Ours is more advanced with the four-chambered heart. Uh, some of the lower vertebrates have three-chamber hearts and the simplest vertebrates only have a two-chambered heart with no separate systemic flow. So the lungfish show the first separation of systemic flow on the scale of nature, if you will. Uh, so these five, well, lungs as well, the uh, gas batter to lung transition, these five um, characteristics link the lungfish with higher vertebrates. So scientifically, it looks like the lungfish became the land tetrapods, four-legged creatures. So this is a lungfish. You can see its lobed fins are, they have that bone structure that is passed on through all of the higher vertebrates. Another unique fish is the sturgeon. The sturgeon is famous for caviar, and they are kind of a weird fish because they have uh, armored plates on their outside. You can see here, armored plates. There is a group of fish called the armored fish that dominated uh, ancient oceans, and the sturgeon uh, is a living fossil hearkening back to these armored fish. So they're the only armored fish on the planet. They also have a retractable projectile mouth, much like a little elephant truck that they can manipulate uh, as they feed off the bottom. So they have this projectile mouth, like a trunk. They have asymmetric tails, which are similar to a shark. Uh, most bony fish do not have asymmetric tails. One lobe is uh, longer than the other in the shark. They have notochords, 
which uh, primitive invertebrates uh, and vertebrates have. They don't have scales. They have that uh, body armor. And they have spiral valves in their guts, which is a shark characteristic. So uh, they are a living fossil, the only uh, group left of the armored fish, which once were common in ancient seas in the Devonian period. The frilled shark is another uh, fish shark. Some, some, some uh, marine biologists lump fish and shark in the same category. Others don't, because the, the, um, the sharks have the cartilaginous skeletons, uh, the spiral valves in the intestine, the asymmetric tail. So uh, it just depends on which marine text you're reading to whether they're called fish or a lot of them are called elasmobranx, uh, a group. But uh, that, that aside, the frilled shark is considered a living fossil uh, as well. The lar longest fish, bony fish, not fish, uh, longest bony fish is the oarfish. We see the oarfish depicted in a lot of art as sea monsters. So these guys here are a living fossil, the oarfish, the longest bony fish. The longest fish, if you count sharks as a fish, is the whale shark. And the most massive fish is the mola mola, or ocean sunfish. We're having a lot of problems with introduced species through the pet trade, through ornamentals, they, uh, through mistakes, mistakes as well. Some have been beneficial, most have been detrimental. Uh, a lot of them are important in the marine environment, but we're gonna uh, walk through a bunch of the uh, introduced species before we start looking at our intertidal zone. The first and most common that causes damage in our coastal ecosystems, our mangroves, and basically every ecosystem is this um, Florida holly, AKA Brazilian pepper. It's got all it's all these little berries, not really edible by humans. They give you a big belly ache and probably some diarrhea, but the birds like them and they spread them quite prodigiously. And you can see here, it's general leaf structure. It has seven leaves on its frond. They are even with each other. They don't alternate. Some, some plants have alternate leaves. But you know, you can see they're right on the same plane, six, and then a terminal leaf. And they're they're oval shaped. Uh, they're rather tough. It's a very common plant. I'm sure you've seen it all over. Very difficult to control because you can't just chop it down. It'll grow from the roots. So it has to be killed uh, using poisons. And this is the species that most of those um, native plant uh, reclamation projects target, the Brazilian pepper or Florida holly. Uh, so really it's difficult to eradicate these species. Uh, lionfish in the ocean ecosystem have been causing great damage. They have lionfish rodeos, uh, Cuban frogs and different anoles. So we have a lot of introduced species, but the Brazilian pepper is one that we need to focus on. Here you can see it's squeezing out our intertidal community. So it's very, very uh, common in Florida. Another common species in Florida, and you can see it's moving up the coasts. It lives in brackish water and fresh water is the walking catfish. And this is what it looks like. It can actually move from pond to pond. We do have the uh, Mayan cichlids and the Oscar, these from the pet trade. Also here, you have the apple snail, which is uh, quite a nuisance. So there's a lot of introduced species and that's just a few of them. Let's move on to the intertidal zone now. Intertidal zone here, you're between the tides. At low tide, the low tide zone's generally always wet. 
only occasionally during the lowest tide is it dry. The middle tide is right between, so you get daily or twice daily inputs. The upper tide zone is only wet during the highest tide, so it's dry most of the time. And the spray zone is mostly dry, only gets wet during storms or misted by waves. And things tend to aggregate in these zones. So this image, you can see the muscles here. Muscles are bivalves that attach themselves to rocks so they can take a pounding uh, with these threads made of protein. They're called bissel threads. We eat mussels. If you go, uh, you'll get the, the mussels, usually the blue mussels, if you get mussels marinara from an Italian restaurant. Uh, we do have a mussel here. It's an exotic. It's called the Asian mussel. Uh, anemones are quite common. We got a few species that live there. The chitons are that, um, they're actually a living fossil. They are uh, in the group of mollusks, but they resemble worms. So they're kind of like a transition species. And we get a lot of sea stars and algaes grow in these low tide areas. In this middle tide area, we get a lot of barnacles here. Mussels, they close themselves up so they can survive. Limpets, limpets are cool. They're like a snail. And what they will do during uh, when the tides recede is they'll cement themselves to the shell, to the, uh, a rock, and wait for the next tide to come. Barnacles close up shop. We do have land hermit crabs and ocean hermit crabs. And crabs can scuttle back and forth between ponds and, and things. Uh, and then up here, you get a lot of lichens in the spray zone. Lichens, blue-green algae grow, so the rocks will be slick. So our intertidal zone is exposed to air and submerged by water. So it has both. It has both. The water washes in nutrients. The air, of course, makes it very unstable for marine organisms. So you have to be able to um, avoid drying out. You have to deal with salinity changes. You have to deal with temperature changes. The intertidal zone is a rough place to live for a marine organism. The spray zone, here's a picture of the spray zone. These right up here, this area, those are called lichens. L-I-C-H-E-N, lichens. Lichens are, you can see right there, L-I-C-H-E-N. Lichens are a, uh, the two organisms living in symbiosis to become one. I mean, they're so intimately twined that they uh, are considered one organism, but they consist of a fungus and an algae. The fungus absorbs and holds water, stop, stop the algae from drying out. The algae provides photosynthate and they grow on rocks, trees, uh, things along those lines. Below that, in the spray zone, right here, you can see it's, it's dark. The rocks are coated in black. That's called the black zone. We, get a, we have black zone too. The black zone, that's upper intertidal or black zone. Uh, we get that black ring around bolt pilings. Uh, we generally get a black ring on Riprap, uh, riprap is uh, concrete that has been put up to stop erosion. Uh, Seawalls, we get a little black line along that high tide line too. Though that is actually blue-green algae, just looks black when it when it dries out. Uh, so the black zone is considered blue-green algae. So the spray zone, you have lichen, you have blue-green algae. You also can have uh, the crabs, uh, the, the, those uh, fiddler crabs, they dig holes in the sandy substrate or the mud in that spray zone, but they dig their hole down into the water uh, so they keep their gills moist. That high tide area you can see here in a salt marsh, these are marsh periwinkles. So a whole bunch of snails. That high tide area you have this is emergent vegetation. Uh, in our area, it's called Spartina. 
So the high tide zone gets wet only during the highest of tides. Emergent vegetation is common when you have a soft substrate. The middle tide zone, here's your mussels. These are all mussels. Here's some brown seaweed. Uh, so our middle tide zone is alternately covered and uncovered. Uh, very common to have your barnacles there. Uh, you get a lot of the mussels. Uh, some algae can grow there if you have a hard substrate. And at Fort DeSoto, uh, I see a lot of a green algae that belongs to the same group of sea lettuce. It's a, a seagrass called Entromorpha. Uh, the sea stars, you find a lot of that. Sponges uh, grow in the shallows there. Predatory snails like whelks are very common, the lightning whelk and, and such. Uh, so you get an abundance of organisms in the middle. And in the low tide zone, it's mostly covered with water. These are from the rocky intertidal zone. But the low tide zone get more aquatic influence. Some of the specific ecosystems, the first around here are the mangrove communities. Uh, mangroves range from, we're at the, about the upper limit of the range, about 28 to 30 degrees north and south. And in between that is where they live. You really, they, they can't tolerate a freeze. So they are a tropical and subtropical species that live between the freeze lines. We don't really get hard freezes here in the Bay Area, so we're, we're, uh, mangroves are, are well suited. But we only have three major species, the red mangrove, the black mangrove, and the white mangrove. So we have three major mangrove species, red, black, and white. Here's the red mangroves. The red mangrove reproduces with these propagules. These propagules are actually little trees that are growing right on its parent plant. They fall off and float, and they can live up to two years before they, they die. So they're fine for two years. They can float around looking for a suitable habitat. Most of them don't find suitable habitat and die out. So the mangrove, the red mangrove, also has these yellow leaves. These are old leaves. They're called sacrificial leaves. Uh, the red mangrove uh, channels salt into its older leaves, and then the leaves die and fall off. So they use that as a mechanism to level off their salt balance. You can also see the root system. They have an aerial or prop root system holding the tree above the high tide line. This allows the roots to stay aerated. This provides great habitat for small fish and plankton. So this is why uh, so many large fish hang out near the mangroves because as the tide pulls out, a lot of these small fish get drawn out in the tide and get eaten. So mangroves are great fishing areas uh, along the edges as a tide is outgoing. When a tide's ingoing, you gotta get right up underneath there because the bait and, and stuff gets pushed back into the, into the mangroves. So outgoing tide around these mangrove roots uh, is very active for fish. Again, the sacrificial leaves, you can see they actually can shoot these roots down from their, uh, their branches, these aerial roots called prop roots. Uh, and the cool thing is they can extend and stabilize islands that way. The Native Americans called them walking trees because of those prop roots. The black mangrove, totally unrelated to the white mangrove or the red and the white mangrove, they have a specialized root system here. Those are called pneumatophores or dead man's fingers. And you can see they aerate the, snow, the soil. And then they have uh, a little different leaf structure uh, and they can secrete salt through their leaves. They too reproduce using propagules, but their propagule is quite different from the red mangroves propagule. These lima bean looking 
with a little stem. There's the tree trunk, but the little stem, little root. Uh, they fall off that tree and float around looking to colonize new areas as well. So they, they propagate using the propagule as well. They're totally unrelated to the red mangrove, but mangrove does not denote a family or genetic link. Mangrove trees actively remove salt. So they are well suited for the intertidal area. The white mangrove, you can see right there that little dimple almost. There's one on each petiole. They have a little succulent leaf. Uh, these help regulate salt and sugar balance. They don't have special root systems though, but they do actively process and remove salts. Uh, so they are a mangrove. So we have three distinct mangrove species here in Tampa Bay. We also have salt marshes. This is not a Tampa Bay salt marsh. This is a North Florida, Georgia salt marsh. Our salt marshes are sparse because mangroves are the climax community in the intracoastal area in Tampa Bay. So we do have areas of salt marsh. It's where the mangroves have been disturbed. Salt marsh is faster growing colonizes. Then the propagules get stuck in the salt marsh and mangrove trees slowly replace it. The salt marsh then moves out a little bit. So they're in direct competition with the mangroves and we are better suited to mangroves. So we do have salt marsh, but it's not extensive salt marsh fields. Like if you go two hours north, uh, there's no mangroves and salt marshes dominate. But if you go to Fort DeSoto and wade off the arrowhead and walk around the flats and stuff, you can find Spartina salt marsh grass and the associated species because a lot of crabs, snails, and uh, things live in the salt marsh. And then a lot of fish live around the salt marsh, uh, waiting uh, to eat those smaller creatures. So salt marshes are, uh, they're, they're, they have saline soil, so they're not rocky, they're, they're soft sediment, that's the substrate, and they're grasslands. This is a Fort DeSoto salt marsh. Again, it's not extensive fields. You'll find extensive fields a little bit further north, uh, but it's an emergent grass. Smooth cord grass is its common name. Spartina is what it's called. It's a, that's the genus of it, Spartina. So Spartina is what, what it's called, smooth cord grass. Uh, it can grow six inches to seven feet. Uh, basically, uh, it averages two to three feet. I've, I've not seen seven foot uh, Spartina, but I have seen four or five foot because it sticks out, you know, it goes out to depth. Now, here's your Spartina. Here's your mudflat. Mudflats are only exposed during low, low tides. By that, I mean spring lows. Uh, the birds love these, these mud flats because there's invertebrates galore. So we call them tidal flats. They're next to salt marshes, which are next to mangroves. Uh, burrowing organisms like clams, clams burrow, they burrow in, filter the water. So uh, a lot of bivalves live in the area, uh, a lot of uh, worms eat, eat, eat the substrate for nutrition. The birds love to feed on the mud flats, looking for invertebrates, uh, coquina, things like that. Now, a unique habitat to Florida are spring fed estuaries. This is a picture from inside of King Springs. You can see all the fish stacked up. The estuary uh, freshwater, 70 two degrees Fahrenheit pushing out, and then it flows to the, uh, the ocean or the Gulf in our case. So these are fairly common because we have karst topography. Karst topography, karst is a German term, but it does refer to a landscape made of 
dissolvable rocks. So you have aquifers, springs, caves, and our limestone is dissolvable rocks. <clears throat> so our spring-fed estuaries are warm in the winter comparably. Now I jump and swim in estuaries and I find it to be cold, but it's always the same temperature. And then when the Gulf drops below 70 degrees, the warm species enter this estuary, including the manatee, which is the most famous. Here's a manatee from Crystal River. So there's a manatee. They are the most famous, but snook and other species that uh, couldn't survive in that cold water enter these estuaries where the water is consistently 71 and thrive. So uh, a lot of species utilize these uh, estuaries as winter wintering spots. We're going to go up north, okay, because this is a world tour. We're going to look at the rocky intertidal zone. I did a lot of graduate work in the Gulf of Maine as a master's student at uh, Western Connecticut. So I studied the phycology of the rocky intertidal zone. The phycology means the algae. So here you have a rocky intertidal zone. Okay, it's between the tides, tides a little bit out, the tide line would come up to here. And you have, there's your seagrasses. The rocks are home to algae. Algae grows attached to rocks. Seagrasses grow in the sediments that break off of the rocks. And they're, like every other ecosystem, they're layered. Okay, so you have, and they're layered just like that, splash zone or super littoral. Then you have your high, high area, mid littoral, infra littoral. Littoral just means uh, between the tides here. Uh, but they're zoned, typical zoned. And you can see life stacks up where you have your spray zone, different life. And as you go down, you get a greater diversity of marine species. So to live in this marine intertidal zone, because it's cold water, you wind up having to withstand currents and uh, a lot of waves. Uh, many of them attach themselves to the rock, uh, like the mussels slash themselves to the rock with those uh, bissel threads. Uh, so the splash zone, you find lichens, you find cyanobacteria, which is the blue-green bacteria, and you find snails, namely the periwinkle. We get periwinkles here as well, so it's not just, but, but ours aren't the cold water. We get the marsh periwinkle that we saw in those pictures of seagrass earlier, uh, the spartina. They, they live up on there. Uh, in the mid-tide zone, you have the red algae that dominates, and then in the low-tide, kelp. Now, the East Coast kelp aren't as extensive as the giant kelp forests of California, but there are several species of East Coast uh, kelp as well. And they are harvested and farmed. We're gonna go through kelp uh, forests when we talk about the subtidal zone. The lichens, here's lichens. And then this is the brown algae or seaweeds. Uh, the seaweeds are attached to rocks. Fucus, ascophyllum, these are all brown seaweeds that live attached to rocks below the spray zone. The black zone, this black uh, tint on the rocks is blue-green bacteria. Periwinkles are snails. Here's a whole bunch of periwinkle. Below that, you find barnacles. Barnacles uh, attach themselves to rocks. We get barnacles here as well. Uh, and then they close their little trap doors uh, during um, low tide. And then during high tide, they open the trap doors and their arms stick out to capture plankton. And then they mate, they mate to the nearest female uh, in, a, in a similar fashion. Now, the brown algae up, up north, the ascophyllum and fucus, they, here's ascophyllum right here. Uh, live attached to the rocks. They grow real dense. Then the red algae, 
This is a type of red algae called Irish moss. Uh, we harvest Irish moss, chondrus is its uh, genus, for carrageen and gels, which we use uh, in processed foods, ice cream, things along those lines. The kelp zone is uh, below that. And here's some kelp here. Kelp in uh, the Pacific Ocean has been measured to just about 100 feet in length. So these algae can get very, very large, and yet they still belong to Kingdom Protista. Here's some images from the rocky intertidal zone, your black zone, you know, your uh, barnacles, your chondrus crystum, your ascophyllum, which is the seaweed. And uh, so these are, are images from the rocky intertidal zone. Tide pools are permanently filled with water, but they get refreshed on the high tides. A lot of organisms thrive in the tide pools as well. Uh, some of the inner coastal subtidal areas right below this uh, tidal zone is called subtidal. So you're not always underwater, but you're underwater most of the time and only briefly exposed. We do have the largest diversity of plants and animals because the conditions are fairly stable. We'll take a look at our local seagrass beds before we call it a day. This is a healthy seagrass bed. Uh, the bivalve picture there, the bivalve, belongs to phylum mollusca. Uh, it is the base gallop. Base gallops are uh, environmental indicators of water quality. They are very sensitive to uh, pollution. <clears throat> They're sensitive to sedimentation. <clears throat> and uh, so they've died out in Tampa Bay for the most part when we had the influx of population in the 70s. Bad sewage treatment, a lot of uh, development uh, caused water quality to drop and the environmental indicators died off, including the scallop. A lot of seagrass beds were damaged. We have had a return of the scallop recently, not to commercial levels, not to even recreational harvesting levels. Like if you go up the Crystal River and those areas, you can scallop. But we have had a return of the scallop. Water quality is, is good now as it's been in 50 years here in uh, Tampa Bay. Turtle grass is the grass pictured here. Uh, here's turtle grass. It's uh, a wide stemmed kind of stocky seagrass. That's the blades. And then the stem of the seagrass actually runs under the sediment and then the roots come off of the stem. So uh, seagrass isn't just like grass uh, in, a, in a lawn where you just have uh, roots underneath it, it actually has a full stem with roots coming off of the stem underneath the sediment and the blades are all you see. So it's really not a grass, it's a flowering plant. Uh, it, it releases pollen and the tides carry pollen and, and just kind of mix it around. Uh, so uh, they flower and uh, such, but this, is, this one's turtle grass. It's named turtle grass because the green sea turtle eats it. Uh, the green sea turtle is named the green sea turtle because its meat is green from eating seagrass. Now, uh, people used to eat green sea turtles. They were the popular table fare. Uh, that's where turtle soup used to be made from, as well as uh, the old explorers, because turtle meat lasts a long time. Uh, turtle metabolism is slow, so if you catch a turtle, It'll stay alive for a long time. It's a source of fresh protein. These um, ocean travelers are out for years and years and years, literally. And so when they had access to protein, they, they took that, that access. This would be a healthy seagrass bed. You can see the substrate is muddy. Uh, they're flowering plants. They're fully submerged. 
They have roots, stems, and leaves. So it's not just like a grass where you have the grass leafy part and then the, the root underneath. They have tiny flowers, fruits, make seeds. They pollinate. So here, the stem is under, underground, and the fronds come off of that stem and the roots come off of that stem as well. So they are not a true grass, they are actually a plant. This lends to a problem because when propellers cut that stem, drive by and cut that stem, it kills a large portion of that seagrass. Uh, they do have the ability to live in salt water. They uh, function normally when fully submerged. That underground stem root system is an anchoring system. They can fully complete their reproductive cycle, so they never need air. Most flowers pollinate on the wind, use pollinators like insects but these guys use the tides to pollinate. And there's really no competition. They're the only submergent uh, plant. Worldwide, there's 57 species. We have three seagrass species here, the turtle grass, the manatee grass, and the shoal grass. Uh, shoal grass goes shallowest water, Manatee transitions to turtle. <clears throat> Very easy to ID them in the field. Uh, if, if you choose to take marine biology on the, on the hikes, we'll definitely pull up seagrass and, and ID it. Uh, they are one of the most productive uh, nurseries. They're a nursery habitat for smaller creatures. And then the manatees and green turtles eat the seagrass, so large, complex vertebrates actually graze on seagrass. Um, sea urchins, this one is, is a little further south. We get sea urchins, but not this spiky. Uh, cardinal fish, pipe fish, pipe fish are really cool. Uh, a lot of algae live, live in these seagrass beds. Uh, we find sea stars, we find the purple sea urchin when we go out and comb them. We find the queen conch is a little further south. But we find the Florida fighting conch. We find the king, king's crown conch. We find uh, lightning whelk, tulips, uh, horse conchs on occasion. Uh, we find really large, large lightning whelks. Pretty amazing when we go through our seagrass beds. A lot of mollusks, crabs, shrimp. Uh, a lot of wading birds are in the seagrass communities. A lot of times I'm asked what's the difference between a manatee and a dugong, and this is a dugong. Looks a lot like a manatee, except it has a forked tail instead of a paddle. Also, dugongs cannot enter fresh water. They are tied to the sea where manatees are estuary creatures. Here's our state shell, the horse conch. We do have a state shell. It has a, it's a large predatory snail and it's pink. And then there's its shell. And I've seen horse conch two feet long, the, uh, the shells. So they get pretty big. This is a delicacy, the queen conch, they're protected because they are uh, utilized as food. Uh, conch fritters, uh, crack conch, a lot of things. Uh, the queen conch is regulated. Uh, I've seen them on dives down in Venice, a little further south in the Keys, they're occasional. Uh, diving in the Bahamas, they're all over the place. Uh, here, we get a little too chilly, uh, but we get a lot of the horse conch and the other uh, large predatory snails as well. Pollution threatens seagrass. They don't handle uh, sediments very well. So sedimentation, uh, does a number on our seagrass beds. Uh, also, uh, prop scars cut those stems that are under underground. That's uh, why we have no wake zones stop from damaging the seagrass beds. Also, the manatees sleep in the seagrass beds. So uh, no wake zones also helps protect them 
uh, because their main cause of death is getting hit by bolts. Sediments can reduce light and smother them. So we have, this is healthy, nutrient poisoning eutrophies them, dirty water and sediment, and then prop scars uh, hurts them. Whereas uh, they can recover, it's a slow process though. It takes years for prop scars to heal. Sargassum is gulf weed. This is the brown algae that grows in the Gulf of Mexico. And when it tears up, it has these little floaters and it floats. And here's sargassum mats. They get pushed out of the loop current and fill the North Atlantic gyra. And you can see that they are floating oases of life. If you recall, we studied that um, the North Atlantic gyra uh, is nutrient deficient, uh, low in primary productivity. These huge floating mats are the main life oases in this huge desert uh, of the deep ocean. They can be big as city blocks large, the weed line. And in the weed line, you will find a variety of fish and species, all different crab. There's sargassum crabs and everything that live in these floating mats, entire ecosystems. It's amazing, different worms and fish and things live only in sargasso, uh, sargassum mats. So they're free, flo uh, free floating seaweeds, we call the weed line. Pelagic fish use them to go around the oceans. Uh, so they're a crucial habitat for uh, the ocean. They're also critical for sea turtles because the sea turtles live in the weed lines for their first 10 to 12 years of life. They swim out and nestle into the weed line and live there as they move around the North Atlantic gyra. And then when they turn to the East coast of the United States or into the Gulf, they are now 10 to 12 years old. Those were referred to the lost years of the sea turtle because scientists did not know where they were. Well, as it turns out, they were uh, in the Sargasso Sea growing up. All right, well, that is a survey of a lot of our shallow water and intertidal ecosystems. Next class will be taking a tour of the kelp forests, the coral reefs, and our deep sea environments. Then we will wrap up the marine biology, marine ecology unit, and move on to our last unit, human influences on the ocean. Are there any questions regarding this lecture or any of the marine ecology that we have covered? Well, then I bid you guys a good day and I will see you all on Wednesday. Don't forget, you have two assignments due Wednesday, the discussion number five and the field guide uh, that um, should uh, take up most of your time, the, the field guide. Have a great day, everybody. Have a good one.